Hi, everybody, and welcome to Metaphysical Insights. I'm your host, William Becker, and I am thrilled today uh, to have a very special guest, Mr. Nate Tarani. Um, Nate and I go back several years now. Yeah. And um, he's he's done it all. Author, um, activist, actor, producer, director, in a doctorate program, um, Navy intelligence. Nate was the first Muslim in the um, National Honor Guard for the president. I mean, talk about it, a double, wow, that's a very difficult, a very honored position to have in any level. Awesome. And um, oh, just so many things. So we're gonna talk about whatever we talk about today. And just a little bit of a notice for viewers. You know, I usually don't make the show political, but um, this one might get a little so, and we're respectful. And also remember that when we're criticizing a government, no matter which government it is, we're not criticizing the people that live in that country yeah. or the people of the faith of that country or the culture or anything else. We're criticizing a handful of leaders that make decisions that aren't that are not always what we see yeah. as the best. And I don't care what part of the world you're talking about, including this one. Uh, so I just want to put it out there because I know it gets oh, it gets bumpy. Life gets strange. Yeah. Anyway, Nate, after that rambling, bumbling introduction, welcome. I'm so thrilled you're here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, and we were just chatting before the show a little bit that, you know, I'm not I'm probably not normally the kind of guest that you have on the show, you know, in terms of like, you know, metaphysical insights and um, paranormal things and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I'm truly honored to be here. Um, I'm just a huge fan of everything that you do. Um, you know, you're one of the kindest, most insightful and uh, loving people that I've ever met. So it's just it's nice to just be able to spend some time with you, you know. Well, that makes me feel really good because I, I've very much the way I've felt about you too. Yeah. I'm, we met, I first heard you on National Public Radio years ago. Yeah. And um, it was working on basic human rights, civil rights yeah. um, as a veteran. Yeah. And um, I thought, yeah, this person where he's speaking from, what he says, this is somebody I want to know. So I looked you up on Facebook and we yeah, became great friends. That's right. It was so, probably around 2015, 2016. Okay. Around that time. And there was, you know, that there was a lot of, boy, a lot of things going on in that election around that time, the primary in 2015 and the election in 2016. And, um, right you know, just a lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of Islamophobia, and, you know, uh, a lot of anti-LGBTQ kind of um, hate, and there was efforts to pit groups against one another. And so at that time, I was doing a lot of interviews and writing and things like that mm -hmm. with a couple different um, veterans groups that, uh, that we co-created and uh, nonprofits and things like that um, to sort of challenge the establishment uh, on what they on their rhetoric, and it wasn't, and a lot of it really was apolitical because you know we saw the rhetoric primarily from one side, but it was coming from both sides. Um, right. So we were set out to challenge that, so we created um, Veterans Challenge Islamophobia as one of the nonprofits, uh, and then um, the other one was Common Defense. Uh, that was really a, a another group of diverse veterans from all over the country that were taking on that sort of that battle at that time. Right. Now, um, people, you can actually Google Nate and get pages and pages and pages of things about him, um, uh, but listing his articles and everything. So yeah. if you want um, either that or if you want to give me a link where people can see things. Yeah, I've sure. I've read a lot over the period of years. I've, I've refreshed myself on a, a couple of one or two old ones and yeah. a new one or two um, just last week or so. Um, yeah. But the 
you you need to read the work people because it's balanced it puts in you put in the facts and I'm trying to figure out how to say this correctly you don't go after attacking hatefully you put out good factual information and cry f for change and you know what needs to be done but um you you don't become abusive in your method and that's one of the things that happens frequently yeah. is that the abuse becomes the abuser in a sense so um, yeah you look at it in just about every revolution that's happened yeah. you look at it in children growing up i yeah. mean you look at it in so many things and you you don't use that approach and i value that it's yeah. it adds a lot of credibility and you can leave reading the article saying okay now how can i make a difference and change yeah. instead of just mad <laughs> i hope so i'm so thank you for saying that because i that's kind of the goal uh it's easy you know i i come from I mean, honestly, I come from a progressive background. You know, I worked right. for um, uh, the Democratic Party as a regional uh, and state organizer, a field director, and things mm -hmm. like that. So that's kind of where I come from politically from a while ago, not recently, like around 2008 was when I first started doing that kind of work. Um, mm -hmm. But in 2015 and 16, like we were saying, we were seeing this sort of heightened um, division, which now has reached a fever pitch. Uh, right. And at that time, I, you know, it, it would have been easy to write articles and give interviews and things like that, preaching to the choir, to other progressives, you know, to other Democrats, if you will. And that wasn't going to get us anywhere. And right. um, and so that was my whole goal was to try to reach folks in the center and on the right. And, you know, and, and generally speaking, I'm very independent anyway, politically, in my mindset. Mm -hmm. um, there's things on either side that appeal to me. And I think most Americans are like that. We're not all just on one side or the other, although we've become more tribal. Um, but anyway, my goal with the writing and interviews and things like that was was just what you said. So I'm glad that that you felt that way because my goal was to not preach to the choir, um, to appeal to Americans' inherent sense of um, equality, and to have a call to action at the end. Right. And so that was. You know, I'm glad that that came through because I. I feel like we did do that around 2015 and 16 and you saw it coming out, you know, in the march in DC and then throughout, you know, the, the first term of the presidency and all that kind of stuff. So. And we shoot, I think we had 100,000, 300,000 the day after the election or the day after the inauguration here in Portland. Oh, did you in Portland? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I was there. Yeah, yeah. I was there. The police were all wearing pink um, hats. Wow. Um, yeah. And I thanked them. Um, That's awesome. You know, if the police are out of line, I'm one of the first to complain. But if they're doing things right, I thank them and I yeah. let the leadership know I thank them. You know? Yeah. Well, me too. Absolutely. Yeah. They do tremendous good in the world. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, as do, you know, as, as I said, you know, I was in the military and everything like that. And, um, and, and when they don't, then we call them out. As right. fellow citizens, yeah, you know, and we have a our police department has a, a sketchy record on social justice and human rights, and yeah. are you I'm in old Portland enough? In Portland, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, and I'm old enough to remember some just downright horrific racist behavior on the hands of a few people, not the whole department. Sure, um, but um, my. I've always had good luck, um, yeah. but I tend to be calm and polite and yeah. courteous, and um, I try not to get into trouble. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, which is amazing. And I think you know one of the one of the issues is that you probably look like the policemen that pull you over in terms That's of. That's true. They recognize you and they identify with that. And one of the things you know throughout what we've seen is sort of like you know, I won't say re, 
retraining, but this refocus on how we approach policing in this country is how do we deal with people that are different from us when we pull them over, you know? Right. So it's easy to sort of let someone off the hook if, if they look like our dad or our brother or our son, but what if they don't, what if there's someone that, you know, we might be afraid of for some subconscious reason, you know, that's when we start getting into trouble or when we had been getting into trouble. So I kind of, I hope that that's starting to turn around. That awareness has been brought into the um, fore a little bit more over the last few years. So, right. Yeah, I do too. And I, you know, it's difficult for me to say for exactly the reason you just stated. Um, and I don't, I do go out of my way to keep out of trouble, you know, and <laughs> yeah. my clubbing days are behind me. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not out at three in the morning anymore. Um, yeah, I'm and no asleep. I'm not um, taking a risk on how many cocktails I can have and still make it home. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the stupid things people can do sometimes. And um, I didn't say people were stupid. I said stupid, stupid things, things people can do. I, I'm i being really cautious, I guess, this show, because one of the things I notice in our society, and it really bothers me, and I notice it around people around me too, is they take a little bit of a phrase, switch the wording sure. to mean yeah. one thing when it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's a jump. People are so used to having something to pounce on yeah. often legitimately yeah. that they're looking for everything. And it just, we need to listen. That's such a great point. And that's what I mean is like, you know, we have gotten to that point where sometimes we can get into this mob mentality online and mm -hmm. it's gotten, it's only gotten worse after the pandemic. And during the pandemic, when people, a lot of people were home and social media was, you know, just kind of what people were focused on as you said, you know, people will take something out of context and, and blow it and blow it up into something that it's not. And, and then, then other people will pounce on it and you, and it really does get into this like pitchfork mentality of mm -hmm. they, they then derive a sense of power out of canceling someone for having an opinion, even if it's something they misconstrued about something someone said. Um, right. And that is not at all where, I saw this sort of movement going around 2015 and 2016. And I wrote an article about it more recently about how this, a lot of this, in my opinion, has gotten out of control. You know, um, it, it started from a very good place and people wanted to do the right thing. But as you said, now it's kind of almost taken on this life of its own where it's like, you know, outrage for the sake of outrage. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I read a, or listened to a bit of an interview with Noam Chomsky earlier today, too. And the question was, when did criticizing the government of Israel or criticizing Zionism become anti-Semitic? And he said about 45 years ago, the Israeli ambassador to the end wrote an article. And in the article, he said that we need to push the idea that anybody, uh, a Gentile that pushes this or criticizes the state of Israel is anti-Semitic wow. and any Jew that criticizes the government of Israel is, um, oh, survivors, survivors morose or um, internalized um, anti-Semitism or something, wow. it needs therapy. So it was a deliberate plan Interesting. years ago to set up a propaganda machine to um, put this out so that you don't question the state. Yeah. And it's, I, I'm not picking on just on the government of Israel. Yeah. Again, not Israeli people, not Jewish people. It's one that several governments have done. Um, and our own can get pretty close to that at times. Well, it's funny. And it's funny that you said that because it reminds me of a lot of, you know, the um, atmosphere here after 9-11, um, mm -hmm. which was kind of this idea of if you, two years after 9-11, if you questioned 
are going into Iraq, which I didn't at the time. I was still I was still in the military. I was in the reserves, right. but I was still in at the time. Um, but if you if you questioned it, then you were inherently unpatriotic. And right. then now when we look back on that sort of the whole quagmire, it's kind of like, why didn't more people question it? You know? Yeah. My dad was a Korean War vet. He was on an ammo ship in the Navy on the war. Yeah. Um, he said, you never saw a fleet disappear so fast as when you put up the flag that you had a fire on board. Oh, wow. um, yeah. <laughs> but he was very patriotic. Um, always flew the flag on Veterans Day and all that. When flying the flag meant supporting of George Bush's wars, um, he took it down and never put it back up. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Because he wasn't going to support illegal and moral wars. Sure. And um, I was really proud of him. He'd come a long way. Yeah. Um, you know, it's nice to see people learn. Um, well, it's funny. And, you know, that's the thing is, you know, in uh, around 2016, when we did the veterans movement, the veterans challenge Islamophobia and veterans against Trump and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What we were trying to do was reclaim the flag, you know, because right. people like Trump on the right were trying to claim that patriotism was their brand of bigotry or their brand of nationalism. And my whole thing then was that is that is anti-patriotism. You know, that that is right. the counter of who we are as a people. So our movement as veterans challenging that ideology must be wrapped in the flag because we are an imperfect nation, but we're continually trying to improve. And right. the founding tenets in human equality and equal justice under law, those resonate holistically across the country. Those are aspirational. We've continued to get better towards those goals, towards the civil rights movement and marriage equality, and, and we're, we're evolving, you know. And that yeah. is a part of that flag. So I think we have to embrace that and not relinquish it to the other side, if you will, in terms of nationalism and isolationism and bigotry and things like that, because that's their that's their goal, if you will. I, I hate to use that term, they versus us, but you know what right. I mean? Yeah. I do. And sometimes it's really difficult with the language because I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah. But at the same time, that's it doesn't feel good because of the divisiveness. Yeah. And I, I don't have... I don't have the pay grade yet I have to figure some of this stuff out um, or the thinking process or something yet. Um, I want to um, check a little bit too with you. And if you don't want to talk about this, we don't have to. Um, but one of the things that stumps me a lot is the whole situation in the Middle East. And I have my oversimplified theories about a lot of what's caused the problems and basically Western governments carving up a bunch of and creating a bunch of countries to control people and wealth um, and to find a place to put a bunch of people they didn't want in their own countries. Um, which I think sums it up pretty well. But how, is there a solution? Because so many people, and I'm not talking yeah. just Palestine, Israel, um, Hamas, Netanyahu. I mean, there's so much in so many of the countries. Yeah. And you were there yeah. during some pretty horrific times in Iran. Yeah. Um, That's where I, my family um, uh, comes from, Iran, and moved to the United States at different stages, but starting in the 1960s, but moved permanently after the Iranian Revolution. And um, having worked in U.S. intelligence myself, there's a term that you've probably heard called blowback. And yeah. blowback started developing really after, as you said, the United States and other countries were meddling in the affairs of other countries. In the mm -hmm. instance of my family's country, uh, my, my parents' country, Iran, that was the attempted assassination and overthrow of a duly elected prime minister, Mossadegh. Right. And 
the American involvement in that through the American embassy in Iran at the time, through Kermit Roosevelt, who was Franklin Roosevelt's, you know, one of his descendants, grandson or right. son, something like that. Um, that then, only 30 years later, led to a growing resentment and the eventual overthrow of the Shah of Iran, who was seen as an American puppet and brought forth the Islamic Revolution that brought in Khomeini and all of the mullahs and the abject human rights disaster that we have now in Iran. Um, right. And that's that was that sort of that was an, that was just a crystal clear example of blowback in the Middle East. And it really only serves to, to make things worse. It, it, we have never gone into a country meddled and, and had it get better wherever no. South America or the Middle East, you know, Asia. Right. So we have to, you know, there's there's a lot I disagree with with Bobby Kennedy. But mm -hmm. initially, one of the things that he said that sort of resonated, and as I said, there's a lot that I disagree with. But he had a really good point when he when he was talking about like if you look at what China is doing right now overseas, they are going into other countries, particularly Africa and uh, other continents, and they're they're building bridges and roads and giving them money for you know different infrastructure projects and all of those things. That's something that the United States used to do that we have sort of, in lieu of that, gone in with military operations in a, a half a dozen different countries overseas. And so we're no longer spending money on building bridges metaphorically and literally overseas. We're now dropping bombs where our adversaries, economic adversaries like China, are building, have taken our place in building that those bridges and building that goodwill. We have to get back to a point where we're doing that more, you know? Yeah, I think so too, um, and including for immigration, but we have to do it correctly, the right motivation. Yeah. A lot of what we did and a lot of what China's doing from what I've been reading is we'd go in and convince the countries to take on these big loans and these big projects. Our engineers and contractors would get most of the money the countries would overspend and then wind up having to sell off national assets at bargain basement prices yeah which our companies would buy up yeah. and people would lose their jobs or have their wages cut right. and china has already done some of that in africa where they're putting on oh well we paid for this port um, you're not keeping up your end of the bargain, hand over the keys. Yeah. And that's part, that's a huge part of why we have the immigration issues. We have still from what the Reagan government did in the eighties, um, not just his government, others as well. Um, Naomi Klein wrote her book, Shock Doctrine, which is a must read for, I think, anybody. Mm -hmm. that describes a lot of this and then confessions of a corporate hit man by john perkins they really yeah, go well together one. yeah 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 um i highly recommend him this was it wasn't his on behalf of the imf it was on a it was on behalf of a, a centralized bank I yeah thought. yeah yeah and um and then um read howard zinn's a people's history of the united states the most up-to-date version you can find he's been gone but yeah. He did get Bush 2's election a chapter upgrade for that. So, we, I mean, we can get at least into close to 9-11 yeah. with him. But these are real eye-opening books. Yeah. And as a student of history. And so I've gotten more and more skeptical in my old age because I've seen up close and personal or th nothing else through reading but living through the times yeah, sure. of how a lot of this works. And we aren't altruistic. We haven't ever, we always, the government always wants something for the help. And I, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's inherent. Um, it's, right. it's, national, it's, it's international chess. Every country does that. It doesn't exactly. make it okay. Um, right. and I, but I think if we're just being realistic about it, every country is going to look out for their best interests. But right. the, the problem comes in, uh, that's a problem to begin with if you're exploiting other countries, but the, the increasing problem is that it is no longer about 
a national identity or individual countries anymore. Now it's right. about a sort of centralized, you know, um, international conglomerate interest that's involved yes. around the world, um, which was not necessarily the case 50, 60 years ago. Exactly. Um, oh, what was that called? Is it neoliberalism that's helped yeah. develop some of that? Uh, yeah. The lot of what we were sold when they were looking at globalization didn't make sense at the time. And I know Clinton was a big pusher of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I've, it's still, yeah, it came back to bite us pretty hard in, yeah. in a lot of ways, I think. And it's not just us, most people. I think, you know, like if you look at, for example, NAFTA under Clinton, you know, mm -hmm the way that it was kind of sold was it i think there were people who believed altruistically in it they believed yeah. that if we if we um exported labor to countries like india and and you know indonesia and other places tech jobs in 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 the first instance that it would help those developing countries in other words the thought process behind it if you were to give it credit was that we we have a lot of wealth in the west it right. helps us to help developing countries you know you know start to build their infrastructure have an economic base and all of those things. i think there was those that had the thought process that that's what we wanted to do but right. we've seen the after effect was that we've literally had you know our blue collar jobs shipped overseas and there's been nothing to take the place of those jobs exactly you know? My mom worked in tech. My mom uh, worked in software and computer programming, and um, for for many years. And uh, she she was a victim of of NAFTA in a very real way. Uh, she was she saw her tech job um, just sent overseas, and basically everyone in her office dismissed. This was in the '90s, you know, uh, when wow. all of that was happening. And then and then the tech bubble collapsed in 2000, and it just it became increasingly difficult for folks that were working those jobs that were being shipped over. But I think yeah. perhaps if if you were just really going to be generous, the intent behind it was, you know, some of the some of the other nations like India, these quote unquote third world nations need an economic base, a working base, and let's help them, which is right. admirable. But it just mm -hmm. as a, it just doesn't it, it does those kinds of things just never work out as intended by the central planners, you know. Right. Well and I'm not even sure that it's not part of the intent because part of the intent of the larger corporations is to drive down labor costs. Yeah. And um, if they can fire people, they don't have to pay them. Yeah. Or yeah. they can negotiate lower wages because eh, do you want to keep a job at half price or do you want no job? You right. know, and I'm cynical enough. I think there's a lot of that in business. Sure. Um, no matter how good the business people might be at heart. Yeah. Just the formation and of the corporate structure, I think, does a lot of that. Plus, if you build up the economy of these other countries, then they can afford to buy things from you. Right. Yeah. You. This is a whole new consumer base as well. Yep. Yeah. And ours is pretty saturated. Yeah. So the whole when you have an economic plan that's based on expansion, you have to continually find new markets. Yeah. And that means you've got to find people that can pay pay for your products. And mm -hmm. I think that's part of what, you know, the Marshall Plan and such after World War II were brilliant in as far as helping to keep another war from happening right away because of repeating the mess of the Treaty of Versailles. Yeah. But there was also the benefit of we had the only industrial interflow infrastructure infrastructure that wasn't bombed to smithereens right. in the world that's right and so we helped them a good chunk of that money came back here yeah and then we also built help build stable societies build friends and a lot of those were loans that people countries like britain paid back yeah um and then in japan the same way we made friends but we also made um, economic partners. Yes, that's right. That, um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we need economic stability. It Absolutely. just, as long as it's not yeah. explosive. Yeah.
Yes, and and Japan, that's a that's a great example. They're having a lot of you know financial turmoil right now um, with the uh, with their currency and the power of their mm-hmm. currency versus the dollar and things like that. But that's that's that is another really great example of you know. Um, you know, if you think about the boom that they had in the 1980s in terms of just industry and technology, all of the best things started coming from there. And and we created a key ally in a very key geographical spot for us as well, um, which is wonderful. And, and you want to see folks thrive like that um, right. everywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. And and you know, you want to have that, you know, f- and, and and President Xi of China recently met with Biden in, in San Francisco, and he, he said the same thing. I mean, we, you know, they are China is in a lot um, worse financial pickle than a lot of people will will maybe admit. Um, but right. basically, she was forced to sort of, you know, come to terms with the fact that this is going to be a sort of stalemate for a while, but that they absolutely need our help and they absolutely need us to be financial consumers of of their goods and partners, strategic financial partners. Um, right. And he basically pledged that they they are not going to. Um, well, hopefully, it's true, but not going to escalate anything militarily, um, particularly with Taiwan. Um, so we'll see. I mean, if if it comes to a stabilization in that area, that I think that will be a very very bright spot that came out of this year and that summit in San Francisco. I hope so. I yeah. really do. I I have little trust for. Um semi-autocrats or uh, autocratic wannabes yeah. just because they throughout history they've always proven to be not particularly honest and sure particularly ruthless and yeah. he's shown that side of him they have, um, they have hundreds of thousands of muslims in internment camps um, they commit all manner of sin against their own people in terms of state sponsored executions and imprisonments and uh, lockdowns on liberties and things like that. Um, that yeah. is absolutely true. But I think one thing you can trust a dictator to do is to work in his own self-interests. Um, yes. And watching their financial uh, infrastructure completely collapse has just been something that they're they're they've been unable to deal with, and they had to. You know, I think it was smart of us to play into that. And um, yeah. Oh, I agree. And if we can help the the North China or the South China Sea, the Japanese Sea with some stability and keep China from building islands and claiming territory. Yeah. Um, and clipping our airplanes, you know, um, it's, it would be helpful. I, I, you know, I hope so, but, and what we've strayed a little bit from the original question I had, and, uh, you've been an intelligence, um you've had experiences that are different than mine um so you might have a better perspective on is there a solution to the chaos in the middle east in general i wish i was smart enough to think of one um well first i think it's the middle east is broad generalization right i mean there are different you know we're talking about the situation with iran um you know what's going on with israel and palestine obviously that's at the forefront of everyone's concerns right now um and then you know syria and iraq stabilization of the region um and making sure that it doesn't deteriorate into factions i mean there's just there's so many complexities that i i really can't say that i have any idea what a solution would look like there. Um, okay. But I think one thing that we can just count on is that everyone will operate in their self-interests. If, right. if you look at any leader in that region, um, th- they're going to work according to whatever is going to serve them the best. Uh, mm-hmm. And that, that's that's going to be, I mean, it, we, we, we've spoken about this before with Israel and Palestine. Yeah. I mean, there's right. been a number of times where um, in the 1980s and even in the early 1990s that Yasser Arafat had the opportunity and the PLO had the opportunity to really start working on a two state solution, but it was not in Arafat's personal interests to take that deal. Right. So they didn't. And I'm not saying that's solely responsible for what we're seeing now. Obviously it's not. We ask ourselves, what are Netanyahu's motivations? You know, what are the motivations of someone like Mahmoud Abbas to the extent that he has any power and hasn't been sidelined, you know? So right. it's it's extremely complex. And 
for them, for the Israelis, uh, October 7th really was like their 9-11. That's how they feel. Right. And yeah. that's why it's been so difficult to have any um, discussion around the response against the Palestinian people. Because on both sides, there's so much emotion that it right. distorts all of the history and all of the precedent that has taken place for 75 years in that region, you know. And horrific violence on yeah. both sides. Yeah. 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 I, I, wish I, I wish I could say there is a solution. Obviously, for me, I believe in a two-state solution for Israel and right. Palestine. Whether or not that is um, still a possibility really is the question. Yeah, I, I agree. I know there was... No, I was talking to somebody you know that talked about some p papers, I think, from Wiki WikiLeaks um, that talked about Netanyahu, some of the Israelis' long-term plans, and they aren't any nicer than Hamas's. Um, and so, and again, folks, we're talking about governments, not the citizens or the people of a religious faith or culture. Um, um, and yeah. I don't know, I'd like to, I would like to think that we could um, find a way to work together. Because part of like we were talking the other day, too, I mean, the the people's the Palestinian and Jewish connection um ethnically linguistically culturally religiously there's actually a lot of connection yeah and it's not it's not that different between i think they're both semitic yeah. semites um yeah. semitic people yeah um and i get along with most of my cousins yeah and the ones I don't, I just don't bother with very exactly. much. <laughs> yeah, and that's a great way to look at it. Um, there is a tremendous, you know, I, I grew up in a in a Muslim family, and mm -hmm. um, and I have a lot of Jewish friends, uh, and there's so much similarity in the way the faiths are practiced in terms mm -hmm. of the belief system and how important your faith is in your daily life. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is those, as you said, you know, it's kind of like being cousins. It, it, yeah. it, it is. And that I think is that lends to the magnitude of the tragedy mm -hmm. is that they're so similar in so many different ways. And if it wasn't for this geographical conflict, then there would be such a great opportunity for peace there. You know, right. it, it's just tragedy upon tragedy. And, mm -hmm. and there really is no solution and i think we're at that point right now where tempers are so flared that you know it, it's really hard to have any kind of honest dialogue about it um yeah which is a shame I, I will say that one of the one of the mistakes i think that the united states has been making for the last couple decades is that we haven't really been playing honest broker even you were talking about reagan earlier even reagan took a much more balanced stance in that region that's true with he israel did. and palestine than our mm -hmm. more recent presidents yes and we have to get back to being an honest broker to mm -hmm. to be able to have any credibility to put together a two-state solution if if it's even possible if i was a palestinian resident i wouldn't trust the united states we've shown not to be trustworthy yeah you know um we've shown to be one-sided you know right yeah but even with that we look how many times um even in iran and i think iraq where we were giving the the opposition every indication we'd back them completely yeah. and then left them hanging and yeah. executed um yeah that that's not a way to build trust and yeah. you can that you know the question of whether or not we should have been interfering at that level is another one i yeah. mean and it's worth it's an important one, but at the same time, if you make a promise and then show up, it's yeah. But it, this kind of goes back a little bit too. When 
I was at Oregon State in the late 70s. Um, and I worked in the food service part of the time and was a manager. And I had, to, I had some friends and employees from Iran and Iraq. And we had a lot of Middle Eastern students, particularly from those areas at Oregon State in those days. And these guys were buddies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Their, their families at home were killing each other yeah. in the military. But these guys were hanging out and drinking together and going dancing together and working together and partying and talking and laughing and having a good time yeah. until one day they all disappeared. Yeah, exactly. It's just like Israelis and Palestinians who are in America. They get yeah. along, you know, just just like brothers and sisters. And uh, and, and it is the same with Iraqis and Iranians. I've, I've had a number of Iraqi friends and um, mm -hmm. and I and I lived through the war as a boy in Iran, um, you know, ducking uh, into bomb shelters every night as the Iraqi bombers uh, flew overhead and the air raid sirens went off in Tehran and everyone would hide and you shut the lights off and you'd walk out in the morning and your neighbor's house was completely destroyed. I mean, I was lucky that I was American born and was only there for about a year or so, but it was right in the middle of it. But right. I never felt any sense of animosity towards a, another Iraqi person. It was, right. the, as you said earlier, it's the governments. It's mm -hmm. always the government, you know? Um, it's these folks that, that, that get into power and commit all manner of sin. And most of the time, the people of that country have no say on whether or not that sin is to be committed. Exactly. And often, depending on what kind of control the leadership has of media, they mm -hmm. often have no idea the depth of the sins that are right. being committed unless they right. personally experience them. Yeah. Um, and we see that all over. It's not just there. I'm, yeah. I'm this country, we've got more freedom of press than most places, but we still have, even in something like PBS, there's what's going to bring in the viewers, what's going to bring in the listeners. Exactly. And um, the whole corporate idea that you have to make money off of everything. Um, and that's a, that's one of the big reasons that I stopped writing as much. And, um, and it was because everything you, you put so much thought and energy and heart into writing a column or putting out articles. And these days with this 24 seven corporate cable news cycle, there's just so much as a proliferation of information coming out by the millions every hour. And it just, it's just like a fart in the wind. Yes. <laughs> Anything you want to say or do, it doesn't matter. Um, because right. there's so much other stuff going on and we have such a short attention span um, that, as you said, I mean, we've transitioned into this 24 seven hour, uh, 24 seven cable corporate cable landscape. And they have to fill every second of that air with something, you know, yeah. And it has to be sensationalized to catch Absolutely. people's attention. Then and we got the podcast and everything else. Yeah. yeah. I was talking, um, a friend of mine in England has been really concerned and everything's blowing up and it's never been this bad. And I'm going, oh, come on. 1984 was my first trip to Europe. Uh, I was 27. And we had the IRA blowing everything up the PLO blowing everything up, right. the Golden Dawn blowing everything up, right. and um, the anarchists from Italy blowing everything yeah. up. Um, you see a car that looks suspicious, you call the police and cross the street yeah. because you don't know when it's going to go off. Right. Um, my ex wasn't allowed in Ireland. In fact, when I went, it, it was going to cost me more to go from London to Dublin than it cost me to go from Portland to London. Wow because of the troubles and you know and it's like yeah things are really bad and we have i live I, parts of my city went up in flame during the race riots of the 60s right. and we were pretty con tame compared to yeah most of the country because we've always had a very small um minority population yeah um and it was came later yeah so um no, it's been a lot worse in a lot of ways. It's just shoved down our throat constantly. I couldn't and it used to be you saw it at six o'clock for half an hour and read it in the paper a little bit, and then that's it. Yeah.
Well, and there's a whole industry dedicated to to, uh, to um, manifesting outrage in each one of us. Because the more they manifest outrage in us, the more we'll post on social media, the more we'll hit their websites and all of that kind of stuff. So there's an entire industry dedicated to getting into our minds and kind of pissing us all off at each other. Um, right. To create that divide, to create viewers. And it, it, yeah, it, that is a shame. But you're absolutely right. That historical perspective is really important. Um, because for most of the lifespan of our young nation, there has been a lot of troubles and the world has been on the brink many times over and oftentimes much worse than it is now. Right. Uh, and I think a lot of folks, you know, that's, it's, it's, you bring up that point. It's so wonderful to have your perspective on that because you're right. There have been times where it's just been so much more precarious, even than it is now, even as bad as it feels now, um, where there's been some tough times before too. Yeah. My grade school and junior high both had, nuclear fallout shelters yeah. <clears throat> yeah and i it, agree that it's horrible that kids have to have shooter drills yeah but we had nuclear bomb drills yeah yeah and um yeah it's i'm not saying one's better than the other let's see there's i want to invite people to to ask questions um there have been uh, quite a few comments coming in, a lot of them pretty much the same thing. I haven't put them up um, simply because everybody can read them. And oh, okay, um, oh, the God. conversation has been going well. Can you see them, Nate? I, I just saw one come up from Sarah. Thank you, Yeah, Sarah. can you see them on the side, though? I just saw that one, though. I didn't see them. Oh, no, okay. Cause, oh, wait, um, never mind. Oh, boy, now I see them. I had not seen them before. Okay. And oh, I've, okay. I've, I mean, there are a lot of really good comments here, but since they weren't questions, I haven't flashed them up online just because we've been talking and there wasn't a good place to put in. And, you know, we can see they're there to see, but please ask questions. Oh yeah. I see them now. Oh, I'm so sorry. I hadn't, I had it on private chat instead of comments. Uh, oh, and that's not- okay. I didn't, tell you i was going to put i just wanted to let you know that people were saying some really good things uh, because i couldn't i couldn't put them all up yeah but ask ask questions for either of us if you'd like yeah if we don't feel comfortable answering it we'll say no thank you um yeah cliff media post uh more about bad things happening because it gets more viewers that's absolutely true i mean mm -hmm. to be all end all is money right and yeah Plus and power, and thence we have we have governments that um, run major disinformation, fake news machines that they can make look legitimate. And yeah. with AI, it's even getting harder to tell it apart and cheaper to do the work. And I I'm not just criticizing Putin. I'm I'm sure that we're doing the same thing. Um, Frankly, if that's one of the major ways to keep safe these days, I guess we'd pretty much have to. Um, that AI know. is going to be, um, I think that it's, um, I I think it's probably not, you know, as scary as a lot of, you know, folks like to make it like the Terminator movie in terms of robots coming online and taking over everything militarily. But there are so many other things that it can affect in, in a very negative way, just in terms of the labor force and, mm-hmm. and not right away, but maybe in about 10 or 20 years. Um, and I had never been a proponent of the universal idea of universal basic income, really. Um, but mm-hmm. if you think about what AI has the potential to do in terms of the jobs that it can take over, which is almost everything, um, right. there has to be some, we have to have some accounting for what we're going to do in the future when these, when corporations eventually put this technology to use, it will be almost like another, you know, industrial revolution in a different way. And we're going to exactly. transition into this new AI economy in a couple of decades. And that's going to be another shock to the system. Yes. And I think some of the people I've been hearing and reading think it's coming sooner than later. Um, yeah. And including a point where AR just takes off and runs on its own without us. There's some technicians or scientists that say it could be 10 years. Yeah. I don't know how, 
it's I get most of my info from NPR. I'm an NPR junkie. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not saying that they're right. I'm just saying they they're not crackpots, um, as far as I know. But it doesn't mean their modeling is correct, though. Yeah, that's the question, and and we're really in uncharted territory here. To what extent do we have a leash on this? Um, and I, I think it's as you. I agree. I, I tend to agree with you. I think it's not very much. Yeah, this thing is 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 expounding upon itself, you know, right. and growing. And so anyone that thinks they can get a handle on it is in error. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. I'm wondering. You know, we we look at a lot of this, and there's so much that's really concerning, but there is positive, too. What do you do to um, find the positive occasionally or to um, not get bogged down just in the the negative feeling of hopelessness that can easily happen um or if you're there how do you get out of it uh it's it's tough if you're there to get out of it because it's so easy to get caught up in it all you have to do is turn on the television and fall into your habits of putting it on this channel or the other mm -hmm. um, but i i've really made an effort to just be able to get out in nature more and take a breath and this conversation with you has been wonderful in reminding me about the perspective, even just from a historical perspective of we've been here before, but a lot of times it's this, you know, media conglomerate industry that's raining upon our heads, all of this negativity. Um, but we have to, we have to really get back to getting in touch with one another in person and, you know, or even via zoom, but that's, we've become so increasingly isolated, especially in the United States um, yes. that it, that, you know, it behooves uh, the corporate entities for us to be isolated and in despair and desolation. But I think the antidote to that is being with other people. I, I have this great friend of mine, Sarah, and I know there's a Sarah in the chat, but she has this small quote on her Facebook page and it's, it says, life is with other people. I like that. It's so beautiful and profound and simple and true. Yes. You know? Yeah. Oh, I like that a lot. Let's switch a little bit now, too, because we've talked about a lot, but I would like to hear more about the acting, the producing, the directing. Um, looking at your film bio, you've been in some pretty major important works over the years and time. and. That's not a side of you that we've actually talked about a great deal. No. And I think uh, it's so easy for you and I to start talking about the, you know, politics and mm -hmm. history. And we both love that so very much. Um, but yeah, I would say that's probably my biggest outlet for just um, getting out of uh, all of the muck in the world, which is creating. Um, and mm -hmm. I love that because you can tell you can tell stories. Uh, it, through that medium and you can, you know, um, share with one another and work with other actors and, you know, um, and creators in that sense. But yeah, that's been a really important part of my life. And I think it hasn't been an easy one for me to necessarily <clears throat> talk about, you know, with others or, um, you know, with my family, you know, and that kind of thing. But, uh, but no, it's been, it's been wonderful. Um, I, I'm genuinely interested in people and I'm kind of a mm -hmm. student of human behavior and a student of human psychology. So for example, you know, when I get a script for a character and they're this like zany kind of off person, I'm just drawn towards them. What is, what makes this person tick? How can I tell that person's story? And then I'm just in my own world with this character and all the rest of the troubles of the world kind of melt away. Uh, and and that, that is a very real sort of escape for me. And it, that has also been an antidote towards to a lot of the other stuff that, that has been out there, you know? Oh, great. Oh, good. Now, which are, how can people find some of the work? Because you've just completed a couple projects. Yeah. So um, um, we just had, we had a small, uh, an indie film. Most of the things that I've done are basically small indie films and mm -hmm. um, 
you know, local, there's been like a national television, uh, like a most haunted place in America kind of thing, but, uh, they're mostly indie films and some are on Amazon prime. The local one that we just did in Atlanta, um, called truth or drink, uh, where I play Miguel Castillo, who's a, um, you know, a, a father is an immigrant and he's battling alcoholism and trying to reconnect with his son. We've just started submitting that to festivals. Um, so it hasn't been released wide yet. Um, but once it's through the festival, uh, film festival phase, then the director will probably release it more widely. Um, and the other one that's still filming where uh, I play, <laughs> oddly enough, I play the president of Iran um, is a horror film called Mokos. Uh, and that is uh, unfortunately about a uh, another pandemic, a global pandemic. But it's kind of a zany horror film, and uh, and then I play the president of Iran in that one. And and the and the president that I play isn't like you know one of the bad guys. He's kind of he's trying to corral the other Middle Eastern nations into coming together, oddly, um, to okay. battle this new virus. So yeah, it was it was somehow cathartic to be able to play that character after what I saw as a child in Iran, because it's like, I got to portray the president that I wish they had, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and I can only guess at her, how horrific it would be there to actually be in it. I heard stories from my grandmother um, about the old country and what happened, and then reading history. But she and grandpa left before it got bad because grandpa was smart and they were going to go back when the czar had everything back under control. Mm -hmm. um, so they left three years before the genocide against us Germans started. Um, but, you know, most of her family was wiped out and a good chunk of grandpa's. Um, and I got to go with some cousins on a tour where we did go to the village and we had a map from grandma and able to stand where her house had been and, or her parents' house and her grandfather's house was still there and my grandfather's house, parents' house and grandfather's house, you know, a lot of things. The school she would have gone to at the end. Um, uh -huh. And um, it helps, but I still wasn't, they weren't uprooting our graves in our cemeteries when I was there. It had been done 80 years before and they weren't, um, they weren't bombing us or shooting at us. In fact, the police brought us watermelon. Um, it's funny how there's these details that you know, small details that you remember from. Well, we were concerned because we've got all these, there were 20 of us, I think, all together, seven from my family wow. and two Mercedes van things and mostly on dirt roads out in the middle of nowhere. And word gets around. We were all Americans except for a couple of people. And um, so even our, our leaders who of the tour um, were a little concerned about why are the police behind us and flashing their lights. Wow. And they were wonderful and gave us watermelons for our lunch. Wow. So, you know, that's something. Um, yeah, I, when I was in Iran, uh, even in the middle of the way that uh, the, as it's, you reminded me of this, like, there's this, there's beauty in even some of these otherwise horrible circumstances. And um, it's such a mixture of these emotions. But in Iran, I, you know, on one hand, you had, when I was there, it was about 1985. And um, it was just only a few years after the revolution. And you had right. this society that was very metropolitan. It was very much a European city, uh, to have, a very yes. European country. And, uh, and it was only a matter of a few years where it became wholly different. But even in the middle of all that and, and, and the awful religious police that were always around and the soldiers that were always lurking around in the streets trying to suppress any kind of uh, action or protest, you still had like kids taking tea out to the soldiers that were standing guard somewhere at a building. You saw it, you know, they, they were taking um, cookies out to a soldier. I remember seeing that as a kid and there was this like disconnect of like, there's this religious police guy who is a horrible person 
And right. on one hand, they're doing horrible things. And on the other hand, some members of the citizenry still recognize that as basically a draftee who's just been forced to do what he's doing. And they're going to take him. I'll never forget the sight of seeing like a kid my age taking taking this soldier uh, a tray of tea and cookies because uh, he was standing out guard by a building for hours and hours without seemingly any break, you know? Wow. That's lovely. Um, and that helps soften the soldier a little bit too, I would <laughs> hope. Um, and it is difficult. I mean, those people, you break the, you don't do what you're ordered and you die. Yeah. And your family can be killed too. And I mean, it's not just the Ayatollah that does that. It's Hitler was pretty good at that. Mussolini was pretty good at that. Um, we didn't usually shoot them. We'd throw them in jail if they didn't follow orders. But yeah. occasionally shoot them, just not their families. Yeah. Um, so, so I see a question here from beautiful. Eric. Oh, good. He says, he, has, he says um, I have a question. Uh, what is the favorite movie you ever did? And... Um, I know it's the most the second to most recent one that I did, but it is it, it is the truth or drink movie um, because that was the first time. And it was the one here in Atlanta where I played Miguel. Uh, that was the first time that I really, truly felt comfortable in my own skin as an actor. And it, it had taken a number of years to get there. Um, but, you know, I have my own issues with not having a dad around and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And just like kind of the thing with the president of Iran, to be able to play that role of a father trying to reconnect with his son was therapeutic for me. They're, the roles are not always that way, but sometimes when you have a director who is willing to give you the space to kind of just be yourself a little bit and find your own truth and you know explore the character, even on the day that you're shooting, um, it can have that moment of true therapy. And that's what that, I, I walked away after that, rather than feeling exhausted, I walked away feeling dare I say, empowered, you know, or at least feeling like, you know, um, a little bit healed. Right. So that one, because of that reason, Eric, that one was, um, that more recent one that we did here in Atlanta was, uh, was my, was my favorite one. Excellent. Good question. Yeah. Great question. Eric's a, a big, um, part of the Simply Spooky network and Jamie, Parker up there is too. So, um, you, um, you wrote a book that you sent me a couple of years ago. And I was wondering actually, because I mean, the, the work that you do is you said simply spooky. And it reminded me of the, the work that you do, the classes that you teach and this whole other world that you're a part of that you and I don't really talk about. Um, but no, is there, is there another, is there another book in the works? I know you're teaching the classes. I've got um, some that need to be written. I've gotten notes for, I've got one on my trip to Egypt. Um, in theory, all of my travels are going to have a book out of them. In practice, as much as I like writing, and I think I'm actually pretty good at it, Yeah, I've gotten to be very lackadaisical about actually getting in and working on projects and getting them done. Yeah. I think in part, the book that I sent you has been received well by people who have gotten it, Yeah. but I, it doesn't sell well online. And I've, I did go through and get a publisher for it eventually that revised it slightly. They made it black and white. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and um, they, they don't work with any of the publish, the distributors that bookstores buy from. Oh, and d bookstores get a, if they buy from the publisher, they get 50 cents off. Well, you can't buy and sell books that way. Right. So the only way I can really sell them is if I'm at an event and get, and I'm in a place where people can see me and see the books and then I'll sell a few. Yeah. But otherwise, and so, I think that's part of why the motivation isn't kicking me in the pants as hard. Sure. Oh, yeah. um, just because the reward part hasn't been as significant um, as I'd 
it's been kind of a letdown. Um, I, I empathize with that <laughs> very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I don't know, maybe people are just being nice, but nobody's, nobody said anything negative about it that's read it yet. It's amazing. And the thing about it is that, um, I, I, you know, I, I think one of the things that we have to figure out how we can do is to get, you know, uh, to get your show, you know, onto one of those cable television networks again. Because right. you have been on. Uh, well, it was cable, cable access. Yeah, right. cable access. Yeah, which is local. I mean, it was out of Salem. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's just staying local. And I had the people with the connections to the show that said, or to cable access that said, we'd like to do this. It would be fun. So it was great. Um, but I'd be happy to do that again. Um, there's a long-term project that we're working on. A friend of mine is a filmmaker here. Um, we can't talk much about it yet. It's got a long ways to go, um, partly because it needs funding. I haven't checked my lottery tickets. Maybe it doesn't need funding anymore. <laughs> yeah. There was a drawing last night. I need to check that was before there? I say. We, we, ben, we may have our problem solved. <laughs> but, um, Indeed. But, I see another question from Sarah in the chat. Oh, good. Uh, okay, so Nate, would you play an anti-character like the soldier the child gave the cookie to? Uh, or does that go against your morals too much? That's such a great question. Yeah. Um, Whoops. <laughs> uh, I, I would I, absolutely play that character. Um, I, I don't have to agree with the morals of the character um, if if I feel like I can bring humanity to it. Um, because that soldier may have a very valid story. And we've seen, it, like, we, you know, we were just saying that maybe he was a draftee um, and doesn't want to be there. Maybe there's a... a uh, a very important backstory. And, you know, it's kind of like uh, an actor playing a villain. And Richard Dreyfus has talked about this a few times because it, Richard Dreyfus, his politics are very liberal, but there's been several roles that he's played a very sort of unlikable, you know, conservative character, if you will. Right. Um, but like in The American President, he played Senator Munson, which was kind of a John McCain takeoff, you know, but right. I would play that role. Absolutely, Sarah. And I will say, though, that I have turned down roles where you're, you know, they were asking me to play the screaming terrorist. Um, there, the, there's, there are roles like what Sarah you're talking about there that are nuanced. And then there are roles that I think are exploitative. I don't say that a lot, but one of those kinds of roles is like this mindless, you know, Islamic terrorist who just yells Allahu Akbar and blows something up. I mean, I've, I've turned those kinds of things down in the past. And, and as a, you know, relatively new actor, it's really hard to turn anything down. Um, but at some point you have to draw the line and I wouldn't have been comfortable doing that kind of a thing. Um, and I've heard other uh, sort of Middle Eastern actors say the same kinds of things that they were initially offered a lot of those kinds of things and they didn't, they didn't really want to work with that or take that. Right. I've heard some of the interviews that made it pretty big, not taking those roles yeah. too. Yeah. Um, and so it isn't like it's a, the end of a career if you have a, have a few morals about what, what roles you're taking. I hate the perpetuation of stereotype. Yeah. And, um, especially ugly ones that aren't true. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It just, there's someone spamming me. your chat. There's some account spamming your chat. looks like. Spamming it? Yeah. This is like sending out a bunch of messages to, to, to spam the chat. Um, oh, from Al Bashi. Yeah. Oh, Oh, might, yeah, I see what you're saying. You might I just want to end that. Delete block user. Let's try that. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, Sorry about some, that, some folks. folks in the chat, uh, Cliff was pointing it out. But uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, see, because Sarah says, yeah, I totally agree. Human side to everyone. Yeah. Oh, the spammers. Oh, yeah. 
They ruined the internet. Oh, yeah, he was he was trying to uh generate readings about and Eric says, besides we were watching one of the mo one of the greatest mediums. Yeah. You did a reading for me once a few years That's ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I've forgotten. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I love the work I do. I really do. Um I could use more of it. Um yeah. and I love teaching people and seeing them open up um and get those ahas and go from I'm a psychic as a stump uh, to, um, oh, oh, you know, that kind of a thing. It's gives me chills. How, um, this is kind of a, it's kind of a big question, but if, if you're willing to sort of um, think about it a little bit, I was, oh, I've always been curious. Uh, did you, did you discover the gifts that you have relatively young at a relatively young age or did you, did it take some time? Um, mediumship. I'm not sure about, I, I saw my first ghost when I was eight or nine. Yeah. It's a beautiful sunny day. It was another kid, um, huh. ghost. And so it wasn't scary. I didn't know he was a ghost and tell the friend whose neighborhood we were in said, no, he can't, I'd asked if this other kid could play with us because yeah. I kept seeing him and this friend said, no, he's dead. Um, it turns out he'd been, I figured out 40 years later, he was actually a pretty famous ghost. Oh, um, wow. People had been seeing him for decades, but um, the, the psychic, the mediumship, I started working on that in my late teens out of interest and a couple people that I could talk to that were interested in it. I grew up in a part of area that's a little bit more rural, um, um, quite a conservative area. Um, the winning football or the football team was about the biggest thing in town and we usually lost. Um, it was a mill town. Yeah. And nothing wrong with mill towns, but the mill paid a whole lot better than my school teacher parents made. Wow. And I think I was in fifth grade before I had another classmate who had a parent with a college degree. Wow. Let alone two. I was about the only one I knew until junior high where it wasn't a question of if college, but which college. Wow. Um, and it's just I'm not saying one's better than the other. It's just a different focus. Sure. Um, and I've always a little different. So on one hand, there's the always trying to fit in, but at the other hand, really learning how to be invisible. Wow. And I was good at being invisible at home a lot of times too. Um, mm. Just not always. It's It's a weird mix. So, I mean, there were just a lot of things didn't talk about or pay much attention to. Wow. And um, so I can't really say for sure about mediumship much earlier. Um, we traveled all through junior high and high school during the summers. I know what um, your state is like in the middle of summer without air conditioning. <laughs> oh, Arizona? Yeah. Yeah, and plus where you are now. Yeah, as well. oh, yeah, Atlanta. Yeah, all the humidity. Um, I've, yeah, um, why anybody wants to live south of the 45th parallel, I can't figure out. <laughs> <I know. laughs> but um, <laughs> that's just me. But yeah, um, yeah um, it's so it's been a it was a journey that was a little bit later looking at but i've been working on it now for roughly 50 years wow some breaks sure you, know, you wind up getting a little over your head sometimes and it's like oh where do these things keep coming from i don't know what they are um i was gonna so ask you about that it gets overwhelming sometimes not really too much for me because with adhd i tune off 
yeah. turn off really easily. I get distracted so easily. Um, but I would be around people who had a lot of negative stuff that kind of this, that would rub off on you. And I'd see all these little block things flying around my apartment or something. And I didn't know what they were. Um, and so I'd get rid of them. But after a while, you think, eh, let's slow down a little bit because I don't have any teachers right now. Oh, wow. And I didn't have any good sources and, sure, uh, you know, at times to talk to. But um, Wow. But I like, I think the biggest part for me is going to places and watching the history. Yeah. And the joy of seeing or the awe of seeing um, – the tomb builders in Egypt or even the in Troy, these women with this cauldron of human blood and going, that's a human sacrifice. Oh my God. And then finding out, yeah, they were still doing that at that period. Wow. There. Um, I, I wasn't sure historically if that fit, but it did. It did. Um, you looked it up later and you found out that what you I saw asked her, yeah, I asked her why. had taken place, wow. Yeah. Um, and so things like, you know, things like that to get the, um, watching the round heads stand around in the, uh, on the Jacob, uh, others on the corner in Sligo, or I just, wow, anything. And then with the, the book to Russia and the, the, Volga German villages. That was really special um, because it gave me to see a little bit more what people went through, what my own people went through. Yeah, you know, I could, I could watch people in my grandma's house. The house was gone. The foundation, a little was there. Um, and I could watch my grandfather's wicked stepmother, makes the stepmother and Hansel and Gretel look nice, um, fly out of the upstairs of the house screaming at me. It reminded me of the butcher's wife scene flying out um, during the dream Tevia has to break off the engagement. Um, and Fiddler on the Roof, Fiddler on where the she's roof. screaming and all this. That's and right. Oh, wow. Because she knew I knew all the stories from my grandmother about how, I mean, she basically stole from my grandparents. She tried, basically tried to kill my grandmother, trying to make her do heavy work nine months pregnant. My, um, my grandfather came home from the army and he had to steal food in his father's house because she wouldn't feed him enough. Oh and it's not like they were poor. These were wealthy people. Yeah. They weren't as rich as my grandmother's family, but they were quite wealthy. Yeah. Um, then it was before the famines were in there. So, you know. Um, that is a lot to take in. It was fabulous because I laughed at her and I just, she knew and I, I, and I probably wasn't as nice as I could be, but I, grandma came to me then in the school and we had a nice chat and she showed me, she looked like a school age. And then as I remember, her, yeah. and she said, you know, and my grandmother was not one to mince mer words, and she could um, she didn't like somebody she didn't like them. Yeah. <laughs> you know she wasn't going to find anything good about the person. Uh -huh. And she said to me in re reference to Grandpa's stepmom, imagine how horrible her life had to have been for her to be so full of hate and so ornery or so nasty yeah so i mentioned so she looked yeah. at compassion so at, compassionate i was just thinking that what a mm -hmm. beautiful perspective to be able to have yeah and it really changed my perspective on it and it's something i try to keep with me sure and think about with people too it's yeah. like okay what made them that way it doesn't mean i'm going to put up with the behavior but right if we can help make um, um, more sense of it and help make 
the other person more than just a, a villain, but a human being that's complex right. and has their own battered and bruised self. Right. Right. Now, a good therapy, a good therapist can help with that. Right. And, um, but yeah, there's a lot of truth. Very true. Yeah. Very true. It doesn't have to be, but you have to be willing to do the work and yeah. go through it. And some wonderful comments here. And I appreciate them all. Yeah. Really but, beautiful uh, comments. Yeah. Yeah. And a great question. Thank you, Nate. Yeah, of course. I, you have such an amazing um, background and um, just a, such a wonderful story of everything that you've been through. And, you know, you're one of those folks that you um, highlight and uplift everyone around you. And, um, and, and, and you yourself have this amazing story that I feel like I can never get enough of, you know? Oh, well, thank you. That's so kind. Cause it's, it's very much a mutual with you. And I, uh, it's, that makes me feel really good and that touches me. Of course. Um, it's not something I hear that often. And so I, I really appreciate it. It's, it is sad that, you know, uh, on a completely different tangent, but this is something I've thought about for a long time that, you know, um, we really just, uh, we're not well equipped to um, communicate how much we care about people to their faces. Right. We might really appreciate them. We might really love them. And the thing that we all need most is just to be able to just to be told that our feelings are valid, that we're important, mm -hmm. that we are loved and that we are um, cared for and good. And to just have that little bit of praise to have a good word, you know, and yeah. we're so reticent to share with other people how we feel about them, you know. Yeah. And then we're reticent to accept it when people do tell us. These yes, things. that's right. That's such a great point. Yeah. Um, we think we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. Right. And um, I've worked hard on learning how to accept compliments graciously. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, yeah. We love you too, Eric. Yeah, absolutely, Eric. Um, yeah, he's a good guy. Um, we have an interest, Vivian Powell has put together an interesting um, group of really wonderful people on the Simply Spooky Network. And so, yeah, it's, it's That's fun. So cool. yeah, yeah, you have a lot of really great folks on your Facebook page too, just super supportive and kind and compassionate people, you know. I've been, I've been pretty lucky um, in life. I've got um detractors and haters and i've i've had my share of bullying and everything else and yeah. you know we don't rent to that type and right. uh, we don't hire that type and we yeah. you know a few of the other things that yeah. um but i've had some really wonderful people in life and yeah. some good role models and um some good role models on what not to be i mean uh, yeah I learn a lot from seeing things in other people I don't like and then notice in myself. It's like, okay, this is a lesson for me. It's not, yeah. a, not about them. It's about me. Such um, a great point. Yeah. Those are, yeah. those are invaluable lessons. What yeah. not to be. Yeah. I've learned that from some of my um, older people in my family, older guys in my family. I've learned a lot of mm -hmm. how I don't want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I'm grateful for it. It's yeah. it all gets to be an interesting experience. So, one one of the things that is most important that I've learned in that regard is that as you get old, like you know, now I'm in my 40s and getting older, and you know, I start I started to see some older people in my own family just become kind of more and more, dare I say, bitter. That might be a little harsh, but angry and. And, uh -huh. and, and start to become a little bit more judgmental of the world and perhaps a little bit more resentful rather than s sort of shifting to a place of that, you, that I would want to be as I get older into a place of wisdom and curiosity right. about the world that, you know, 
that dichotomy has been made more and more clear as I've watched some of the men in my family particularly get older. Um, and, and it's been such a, I'm, I'm so grateful to God that I've been able to see that, you know, have that, you know, have that sort of um, reminder of that's not the kind of person that I want to turn into. Not that they're bad people, but I just right. don't want to be, you know, angry. It's not the life you want to live. It's not the, not the way you want to see the world and such. I, I think I get it. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. Yeah. Oh man. Oh yeah. That's such a great, wow. Cliff. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And there's, and I was so lucky. I, I was never physically abused. Um, the emotional could be there, but it wasn't intentional. Um, it was. Uh, that's a that's a whole nother story. It is um, a whole other story. I you know yeah. I kind of I identify a lot with uh, with what Cliff said too because I had a dad like that. I don't know if you okay. can call him a dad, but yeah. And in a way, you know, my parents got divorced when I was about eleven, and okay. so in a way that ended up being kind of a good thing because he left and I never saw him after that. And it was okay. ended up being good that I had the positive influence of my mom. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know a lot of people who beg their parents to get divorced. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the dynamics in the home. And um, yeah, I, people say you need a, a mother and a father and all, but only if they're loving people that know how to express it. Right. Um, if all they can express is anger and pain on a child or on a loved one, then that's not a healthy place to be. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. We haven't talked a lot about it. It hasn't seemed like an area you wanted to go. So you haven't, you haven't asked much about Oh, about my father. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I, your mother's somebody I'd like to meet. Yeah. Well, and I've told her, you know, she knows all about you too. And she wants to meet you as well. She's, um, she's been my saving grace in my life. You know, mm -hmm. she is my alpha and omega in so many ways. And she's been a single mom who, you know, we were Batman and Robin growing up and, um, you know, she's, she was an athlete her whole life. She competed for the, um, with the Iranian uh, women's national team in basketball and volleyball and wow. swimming and at the Olympic level. And um, she's, she's just such a prolific person. <laughs> she's, yes. you know, she's so amazing and so loving and compassionate and wonderful and strong. And um, she, after my father left, she, uh, you know, carried us through everything and um, just her and I growing up. Mm -hmm. And um, she had to undo a lot of the damage that he had done you know, through his right. actions and stuff like that. And she did such an amazing job of it. So I, I just, that's been my true blessing and saving grace. You know, I talk oh, more, I, maybe I don't talk about my dad as much because I just have so many things to say about my mom. Cause she's just so yeah. and, you know. Well, tell her, thank you for me. I appreciate it. And what she did. Yeah. So I definitely will. I'm sure she's, if she's not watching this now, she'll watch it. Um, okay. At some point, she's she's like that. She wants to know what's going on with my projects and, you know, auditions. And she's the first one texting me to say, how did the audition go and all that kind of stuff. So. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, uh, is there anything you would like to add to people um, as we kind of wrap up or have anything you want to put out there? I just I'm so grateful that folks, you know, um, uh, this sort of really ended up becoming uh, interactive um, with mm -hmm. the folks who are watching. And I just think that's so beautiful. And I'm sorry that I hadn't seen any of the comments earlier. Um, but uh, but no, I'm just so grateful to everyone for tuning in. And I feel like we had a wide ranging discussion. We yes. really get so many different topics. Yeah, which is part of what I love talking up with you and have to be careful to remember this as I'm going out live without any filters. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the internet is forever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes we, 
it's important to uh, um, oh, just remember not everything is public. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, but I can't thank you enough. Um, and all of these comments will be on the Simply Spooky page. So you'll be able to read them. And, oh, cool. okay. Yeah, and I'll send well, you the link. I'm grateful links. to you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I truly, I feel blessed to, to, to have been able to be here with you. And, um, you know, outside of being friends, I'm just a huge fan <laughs> of your work. So, so thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, you're welcome. Thank you so much because, um, again, it's mutual. And it gave me, I've gotten to talk to you twice in a week. I know. Weeks, instead of going six months. Um, <laughs> between right. text messages or something. Texting, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I that's know. a busy man, folks. <laughs> um, just, we, we've fallen into texting um, and with everyone, friends, with mm -hmm. my mom. And um, my God, I can't even remember the last time I actually spoke with someone on the telephone. We actually spoke on the phone instead of a video chat. You and I. You're yeah. probably the last person I spoke with on the telephone outside of calling, you know, for some random thing like a store or something like that. Yeah. The right. conversation that I've had. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have, a, I have a few of them. Um, but, oh, fantastic. But again, thank you all so very much. I really appreciate the wonderful comments and the kindness and uh, you tuning in and watching and Brother, I, a big hug and um, big hugs to you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. And much peace. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Cliff. I saw that. <laughs>